I'm Yoko Ono, and I'm speaking freely. That's what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the parts of Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about free expression in America. I'm Ken Paulson. Our guest today is Yoko Ono. Great to have you here. Thank you. You know, after a century, a half century of creativity, you can make the case that your uh, popularity, your visibility has never been greater than it is right now. It's true. I'm very amazed, yeah. We, uh, yeah. I just happened to pick up a recent CD. Your music is uh, being embraced uh, by a new generation of young people. Uh, and the remixes of some of your work, Open Your Box, uh, was, was a huge dance hit. Uh, it's a... Uh, that, of course, along with Walking on Thin Ice, yeah. which you can hear in, in clubs all over the country right now. And then uh, mm -hmm. in the past two years, we've gotten this extraordinary book called Yes, Yoko Ono, uh, which was based on an exhibit, uh, a remarkable retrospective of your work at the Japan Society. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, you are someone who has faced um, a mix of critical acclaim in some quarters and mean-spirited criticism in others. Uh, dismissed by others, and in fact, I remember a quote by you where you said that you didn't mind if you put on a play, for example, and everyone walked out because that would mean <laughs> that you had done something that wasn't easy, that you'd, that you'd well, touch people's too, emotions. Yeah, maybe. Touching their emotion in a very kind of strong way, maybe. As someone who was ready to embrace unpopularity as a positive, how are you dealing with this popularity now? Well, I'm not used to it, so I, I don't know. <clears throat> I have to think about it, really. <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the things you're best known for, in addition to your art and your collaboration, of course, in partnership with John Lennon, is your lifelong commitment to peace. And, and we want to talk about that during the show as, as well. I was struck, though, reading a bit more about your early years, that, in fact, you were in Japan um, yes. in 1945. And <laughs> you saw the horrors of war firsthand. I know. It was, uh, it was terrible, really. And you do you have a recollection of that time? Yes. Well, you know, it was a very um, difficult time for me, but also it did um, leave an incredible impression on me. And, and do you think in part that is what has given you this lifelong commitment to against war? Well, I wasn't aware of it that way, but probably that had a lot to do with it. You know, the great misconception, as you're well aware, uh, of you is that that you were not well known when you connected with John Lennon, when in fact you were somebody who had a, uh, you were in the recital hall at Carnegie uh, as early as 1961. Um, you were regarded as an important avant-garde artist, an emerging talent. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that career began? I, I was, I was uh, <coughs> very interested to read that you're, as a young girl, you yeah. you went to your father and said, "I want to be a composer." At a time, well, because he wanted me to be a pianist, and there was a a certain point when I think he was listening in the next room or something and telling my mother, "She's not going to make it," you know. <laughs> and I was a bit hurt, but I really agreed with him. And um, so I had to just sort of, I wasn't going to tell him about it, but I said, "Well, you know, actually, I want to be a composer instead of a pianist." So he, he was really kind about that. He was saying um, he's never heard of a, a women composer, so maybe women don't have the aptitude mm -hmm. to be a composer, and, I, and maybe I might uh, struggle in vain or something. And he felt that it would be easier for me to do, well, to be a singer and sing other people's songs. Uh -huh. and, uh, and you were not terribly discouraged. You, uh, you went to Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville and then came to the city and found new and creative friends. Yes. It was, very, it was a very exciting time for me. Yeah. And, you know, your, your art was unique, has always been unique. Um, was there anyone in the world that you modeled yourself after, or did it all just come from the heart? Well, I don't know. It seems like I couldn't help being myself because um, even in the early days, when, when I write a poem, they would say it's 
it's almost like an essay. It's a little bit too long for a poem or something like that. And when I write an, a short story, they would think it's too much like a novel. When I write a novel, they thought it was too much like a short story. And there was always that, there was one point uh, in my creativity that was a little bit off, you see that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just couldn't help it. I was like that. No. The, uh, the people, the artists y you were drawn to, um, shared that sensibility though. These were creative people mm -hmm. who saw art differently. And uh, there was a movement at the time called Fluxus. And I, and I, I know that you didn't regard it necessarily as a movement, but, but many others have described it as, as what you were part of and what you helped inspire. Uh, could you describe Fluxus for those who have never seen that movement? Well, it, it, it certainly had some sense of humor and also there was a kind of rebellious attitude about it all, and the concept was very fresh. Um, I mean, I, I really think that uh, it was a very, and it is a very good movement, and it's still going, I think. Yeah. What was the first piece of art that you exhibited publicly? Do you recall? Well, um, well, because I had a loft, and what happened was, at the time, um, it was very difficult for composers because there were only two holes that you can um, uh, express yourself as composers. One is the Carnegie, Carnegie Hall, well, Carnegie Recital Hall, too. It's a small one that's right next to Carnegie Hall. And Town Hall, mm -hmm. only three, mm -hmm. actually. And to be able to perform your work in Carnegie Hall or Town Hall, that's like, well, you know, Stravinsky could maybe, right. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of situation. And uh, most of us probably did something in Carnegie Recital Hall, but even that was very difficult. Uh, people like John Cage did it, but, um, and then I did it too, but um, I was feeling that there were so many incredible creative, creative um, friends, and I thought, why don't I um, create a place for them to express themselves? And so I got a loft mm -hmm. and started a kind of... Uh, a concert series with a friend called Lamont Young, and we did it together. And um, <clears throat> and that was called the Chamber Street Concerts. And it's the first loft concert. Mm. And so most of my things were expressed there first. So it was my loft, and you know, of course. <laughs> and then I did it in um, um, George McCunis's gallery, which he had in Madison Avenue. So maybe that's the first expression of you dabbled in uh, a wide range of, of media and, and turned to films in the mid-60s. Um, probably your best known, most notorious, is Bottoms. <laughs> yes. Uh, a mm -hmm. series of photographs of the backsides of how many people? Uh, well, it was supposed to be 365 people, uh -huh. or backsides, but um, I think it was like maybe 200, a little bit short of 300. You had them on a treadmill? Yes. Um, how did you recruit people for this? Well, they were actually, um, all my friends didn't mind it at all. <laughs> they thought that it was a nice way to sort of, it was a protest. It's a kind of a, a, a way of um, uh, creating a kind of uh, peace protest. Mm -hmm. and, and the British Film Board disapproved. Is that right? The, I know. And yeah. And they told you could they, not be they, exhibited? They censored it once. And then, of course, I had to demonstrate and say, please don't censor it and all that, you know. And I was carrying flowers, lots of flowers, and mm -hmm. I was standing in front of the censor. <laughs> and it was really amazing. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, well, these are flowers for, uh, what was his name? I forgot the name, the, the person who was censoring it. So <laughs> then I was invited in. and. When I went upstairs, there were my daffodils all over the place. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. My flowers went there first. Yeah. The uh, an, another much talked about work uh, was a performance piece called Cut Piece, uh, which you did in September of 1966, I believe, and and in which members of the audience mm -hmm. are invited to come up and actually cut pieces of clothing off of you. Yeah. You're a very trusting person, aren't you? No, I wasn't necessarily. <laughs> But it was just, um, I thought it was a good idea I mean, as an artwork. 
So when I think of a good idea, or a creative idea that I think was good, then I just do it. Mm. And then in the middle of it, I was, ah, oh, this is a little bit too much news. You just get like that, you know. <clears throat> Did it surprise you that you became a sensation from that, the people all over London talking about you? Well, no, it wasn't a sensation at all at the time. The first time I did it, well, it was a quiet sensation in our Bengali world, let's put it that way. But um, I think by the time I went to London and did it there, uh, it was the swinging 60s and the Londoners loved it, and you know, so it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that helps set stage for the, the exhibit at which you met John. <clears throat> yes, well, I, I did a show there in London, in Indica Gallery. And uh, the famous piece that drew John Lennon, and as actually the title of the retrospective is Yes, <laughs> which uh, I wish people could see. It's, it's hard to convey verbally, it's hard to convey in, the, in a book, but it, you, you walk in and there's a ladder. Well, there was a ladder, and then you're supposed to climb up the ladder, and then on the ceiling, there's a kind of painting that's there, and you want to see it, and so you have this magnifying glass that's kind of dangling, and you put the, the mag magnifying glass there and so it's look at it, and it says yes. And, and the story goes, and you would know, that uh, when, when John walked, marched up the ladder and saw yes, he was excited about that because he... Well, he felt it was a personal message, <laughs> didn't I think. <laughs> I didn't think about that angle, but anyway, <laughs> at the time. But... Uh, uh, when he came down from the ladder, um, he didn't seem that excited or anything. He just looked at me and just went like mm -hmm. that and just walked out, you know. And the two of you connected again days later, weeks later? About two weeks later, I think, in Klaus Oldenburg's um, opening or something like that, mm -hmm. I was there. Were you, did you know that a Beatle was there, or did you have any idea who John was at the time? At the time, I didn't, but right after he left, there were students from um, St. Martin's Art College, I mean, art, art school, I suppose. Um, they were helping me for the display, mm -hmm. and we just finished the display, so they were kind of standing there. And one of them said, is that the moon? So I said, what? He said, I think that's John Lennon of the Beatles, you know. And the way he said it very slowly, it sounded very impressive. Uh -huh. I said, oh, really? <laughs> it was funny. And uh, in time, a partnership was born. And in the, in the truest sense, and it's, it's interesting to work, to look at your work with John, in that, um, well, you would know the dynamics better than anyone else, but clearly, you helped each other. You, you, John Lennon did things he never would have dreamed of doing without your participation. Did it work the other way, too? Did John help your creativity? Well, it helped me in the sense that, um, well, how did it help? I'm <laughs> just thinking. Well, I think that um, the fact that he was much more experienced than me in terms of um, the worldly aspect of um, life. Mm -hmm. and, and for a time, well, I, I, what was interesting, do you think John... Oh, he did a portfolio called Bag One. Would he have done that without having you you there to help him through that process? Would he have had well, the confidence? Well, I didn't really help. I mean, uh, well, who knows? Uh, he might have done it. Um, I think he was rather uh, timid about doing something like that. And uh, not something like that in terms of erotic art. I mean, it, that's not what it was. And, but it's just um, doing something in the field of art, sure. because he felt that now he was a Beatle, and nobody wants to know something like that. Right. Well, he, his, his artwork has been reproduced, and you've, you've helped preserve and protect his legacy. That uh, the Bag One portfolio, in addition to having, oh, mm -hmm. a wide range of work. So the, the alphabet is 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 great fun. Um, there are illustrations of your of your getting a marriage license, getting married. <laughs> Um, and then there are some erotic pieces. Uh, and here come the censors again. Uh, oh, I know. What happened? I was totally... Well, we were in uh, Toronto at the time when we heard that it was censored. And so we were just giggling, you know, <laughs> because it, it was in the midst of um, a sexual revolution in the 60s and all that. And so what happened? Why are they censoring it, you know? 
and they wouldn't have done it if it was Picasso. I mean, you know, you know many artists who went into delving in erotic art, of course, and so I thought it was just a normal thing, mm -hmm. but they didn't think that way because it was John. Right. And, uh, and it was regarded as obscene. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, in the art world, it wouldn't have been considered anything, mm -hmm. and I didn't think I didn't even think about that way. I think maybe I blocked it or something. But I thought the well, um, the lines were beautiful, very artistic, and all that. That's what I thought. It was great. Well, the, you and John uh, went into recording studios, or uh, maybe this was portable recording equipment. Things like the wedding album and, and Two Virgins. Um, in a very short time, you had a number of albums out, and and uh, that challenged. John's usual fans. <laughs> uh, so well, I think that, uh, well, obviously I offended them. I, I wasn't even um, aware that I would offend them, you know, or I, I wasn't even thinking about them probably. The, um, <clears throat> again, you had a censorship battle of the week, basically. I mean, on Two Virgins, the album cover is a picture of you and John in the nude, front and back. Um, and, and that was, in, let's see, the Union County Prosecutor's Office in New Jersey seized all the copies of that album coming into the, to the country from that port. Uh, all over the country, there was great, all over the world, people were saying this record can't be released. Or, or In the end, it was sold with a plain brown wrapper. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, there had to come a point when you, when you were thinking, you know, here we go again. Well, I just thought there was a very artistic venture. <laughs> yeah, and you never thought, you know, we want people to hear this music. Maybe we shouldn't put this on the cover of the album. Maybe this will cause more trouble than it's worth. Well, I thought it was an independent, uh, creative event, you know, mm -hmm. and it, t together it was very interesting. I thought, but in hindsight, I do get a little bit embarrassed about the bag, bag one erotic art, and and also the uh, two versions cover, because now I know how people looked at them, you know. Mm. Well, when you were not in the headlines because you posed nude for a record album, you were in the headlines because you were making a statement for peace. And, yeah, yeah. and I've never seen such a creative approach to a honeymoon. <laughs> uh, you and John got married and decided to take advantage of all this press interest and, uh, and had a bed in f for peace. Uh, you knew how to draw the media. Well, he did. He did, I see. <laughs> And, uh, and, and that constituted, I guess, uh, two separate events um, in 69? Well, I think that, well, I knew how to um, organize things. I mean, the creative art, as expressing creative art. But he had a kind of um, way of putting it on a different level. It was very interesting. So in that sense, I think it was a very good match or sure. partnership. Yeah. Well, you, as you said in in bed, surrounded by reporters, asking, I think, kind of cynical questions um, about your sincerity and, and how, you, how you define peace. Um, did you feel like they were listening? Did you feel like the world was listening at that point? Or was this just a desperate They were attempt? listening. Yeah. They were listening, but in, in the wrong way. I mean, they thought that we were crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a lot of attacks, and I, I, we were actually very surprised and disappointed. But it was, you know, if people made fun of it then, it's now almost an iconic uh, move, moment in the movement. The photographs of, of the two of you are, are classic photographs. We had um, Tom Smothers on the show not long ago. Oh, really? And he talked about sitting by your she bedside yeah, right. and playing uh, Give Peace a Chance. In fact, he, he remembered with some embarrassment that John told him to tone it down on guitar, that that Tom was trying to be too fancy with the guitar and <laughs> wanted to play. Yeah. Um, and, and in that recording session came, out of that recording session came Give Peace a Chance. The, um, the peace movement uh, was dear to your heart and, uh, and clearly you've had a commitment to that throughout your lifetime. Um, it also got the attention though of the American government and uh, a, a couple of books have been published, one in particular that details the FBI files on John and uh, it talks about him being under surveillance and appears to suggest that he's being targeted 
it, because of his political beliefs, um, for deportation. Was the public was the release of those documents sort of a confirmation for you what of what you believed all along? Did you did you have a sense that the government was out to get John? Oh, of course they were trying to, and we knew it, and so it was no surprise. And and but also, <coughs> I didn't really look into the released information and documents and all that because it was just kind of. Well, I, I just don't want to know about it now. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just blocking it from my <laughs> mind, I think. Uh, it was a d difficult time, and in the end, justice prevailed, and John was able to stay in this in this country and, and make many contributions to his adopted country. Um, I was uh, reading uh, about a, a review of your of a, of a show you had at the Everson Museum in Syracuse back in 1971, and the local newspaper was attacking the the museum, saying. Uh, at a tremendous loss of good taste and of respect in the art wo world, <laughs> they've chosen to, to book Yoko Ono. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, well. <laughs> that was hidden from me. <laughs> well, well, I'm sorry to break no, it to no, you it's this fine. Late it's day. great. So. But, you know, in sharp um, contrast to what we see here in this book, um, what was it about your art that offended, frightened, disturbed people so much so they said this shouldn't be shown in public? Well, because one, I was an Oriental woman, well, Oriental and woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, uh, standing beside John, mm. as if I was, I had the right to, instead of maybe walking three steps behind him. I mean, it, it, that, that's the kind of thing, that basically. And it was very strange because uh, at the time when we came to New York, we did um, a radio show. Uh, just, you know, and, and tons of uh, fans, um, Complained. They they called up um, this uh, DJ and complained that I was stepping on John's talk. Mm. Like when John was talking, I would just inter interfere and start talking or something, and it was very unpleasant. So the DJ wanted to know if that was true or not. Then he listened to it, and he realized that John was the one who was stepping on me. <laughs> and I was never doing that. Of course, I'd be very careful. By the time that was going on. I knew that people didn't like if I stepped on John's talk, so I would never do that. So I was really surprised that that was the kind of perception, despite the fact that I wasn't doing it. You know, it, it's uh, it's common perception that you had some role in the, the breakup of the Beatles, and that's oh, obviously, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and that has been there's all kinds of antipathy directed towards you because of that. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think in the last. 20 years, and perhaps tied again to this kind of resurgence of interest in your work, is there's also maybe a grudging recognition that you're also protecting his legacy uh, in, a, in a very a positive grudging way. Grudgingly, they have to admit, maybe. Well, well, I'm, <laughs> yes, that may true. be the case. But, but the, you know, for a great example is what you've done now with John's childhood home in Liverpool. In addition to preserving that piece of property, you've preserved his music in a lot of different ways. Uh, you've documented his music. You you won a Grammy Award for your work on Gimme Some Truth, the uh, the making of John Lennon's Imagine album. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. <laughs> and, and you uh, you also organized a, a nice benefit uh, for the Red Cross and other relief organizations uh, held at Radio City, uh, which was a, a night for that was very good, yeah. John's uh, words and music. And, and of course, your son Sean also performed. I know. And did, uh, and did Julia. Is that yes. The, uh, and, you know, it was very nice of him because Naturally, it's very difficult for him, you know. So I think that the first idea that he had was just sort of like uh, <laughs> crawling in a bag or something and not, <laughs> not to ever come near the hole or something, you know. But then, I mean, a musical. And, but, um, <laughs> um, but then he said, okay, we'll do it. You know, it's very nice that he and, did. And he chose a song that John wrote for his mother, which was uh, very powerful. Uh, so, so you know, no one needs to be reminded of John Lennon's contributions, but but you've managed to to maintain his visibility with new and interesting projects and and works of art. You also have honored his music in other ways. Uh, I was struck by your reaction to uh, this mess at Clear Channel, where some employees oh, put know. together a list. <laughs> um, you know, they say the corporation didn't do it, but we do know that. Throughout Clear Channel Communications, a huge radio company, was sent a list of songs that they suggested not be played, and and there's some strange songs on there. But the oddest selection is they're telling people, imagine, 
shouldn't be played because of the sensitivity in the wake of September 11th. What was your reaction to that? Well, <clears throat> I felt that I wanted people to know that uh, it's not a dangerous song. It's a very normal song and, and the song that people enjoy all over the world. And so I just put one line of uh, imagining all the people living life in peace in uh, the New York Times or Sunday Times ad, you know, and then from then on I'm just kind of promoting imagining. Mm. In, in closing, given, given your lifelong commitment to peace and the fact that you were there when, you encouraged, when John encouraged the world to give peace a chance and, and you have been a voice for peace for literally decades and most recently in the, in the wake of international debates about Iraq and military action, Again, you were paying for billboards reminding people uh, about the need for peace. Do you ever get discouraged? Is this, a, is this a message? Is this message getting through? Oh, yeah, sure. I think that uh, we should not be too impatient. And, you know, just like a dance step, you know, you go one forward and then one back, you know, going like that. You know, it's fine. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure. It was my pleasure, too. Our guest today has been Yoko Ono. Please join us again next week for Speaking Freely. Join us next week as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts. For more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.